Hey guys, Dr. Q Standers here. I want to welcome you to 2019 Leaky Gut Secrets. And the big thing about this is I want to kind of give you an overview of some things we're doing clinically that's a little bit different than what's on the internet right now. Um, so if you're new to Leaky Gut, hopefully this covers a lot of the information. If you're uh, an experienced veteran with Leaky Gut, hopefully you'll have um, some insights as to how we're doing things slightly differently and what are we doing in, in certain scenarios. And one of the benefits of me going through presentation like this rather than just writing an article is that I can cover some of the nuances as I get to the topics that allows us to um, really look at you know the individuality of a person so everyone's slightly different so let's go over this really quick um, why do we care about gut health so this is a big question you know is gut health really that important um, and I would say yes it's huge because the increasing incidence of immune regulatory disorders as you see in this slide here is skyrocketing or in other words we're getting a lot of chronic illness that we didn't really have before and that chronic illness is um, something that traditionally as up to this point, um, there's not a lot of conventional medicine answers for. Or in other words, conventional medicine has focused more on acute, um, re, uh, acute conditions as well as acute treatments to where, you know, maybe, maybe a, a, an injection or a medication can really create a huge change in a matter of days, weeks, or months. Um, and sometimes in gut health, while we hope for days, weeks, or months, sometimes chronic illnesses are a little bit different or they take longer or antibodies are elevated and we have to spend our time working to get those down. So the big thing to know about that is why do we care about the gut? Because a lot of these immune regulatory disorders arguably are all coming from the gut. Um, so if you look at this, so, you know, anyone that has joints, which is all of us, you know, is, is prone to possibly getting arthritis as we age. And, and this little study here, essentially all it shows is that, you know, inflammation in your body is associated with your mucosal immunology or your gut health. And knowing that it's associated with your gut health is pretty critical. Um, so more stats on why do we care. U.S. makes up 5% of the world's population but consumes more than 50% of the world's pharmaceutical drugs. That's a problem. Uh, we spend more on healthcare than Japan, France, China, UK, Italy, Canada, Brazil, Spain, and Australia combined. So we're spending a lot on healthcare, but we're really not seeing the results in the chronic conditions that we're looking for. Uh, we rank last or among the last of developed nations for infant mortality and life expectancy, another problem we have. We also suffer from lots of chronic illnesses. Uh, so we consume 25% of the world's supply of glyphosate, which is pretty important, and we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so this is the pop quiz I like to start out with. So go ahead and go through these and see, okay, do I have any of these symptoms? So you can check gas and bloating, anxiety, depression, brain fog, chronic fatigue, history of constipation or loose bowels, any discomfort when you eat. Are there any foods that you say, oh, well, I can't have fried foods because my stomach does X, Y, or Z. You know, are you chronically waking up in the morning? Are you, are you 30 years old and you feel like your joints are 50 years old? You know, if you're under 50 and you're waking up and your joints hurt, you have, you know, some kind of inflammatory condition and, and we have to figure out why that is. So if you have any of these conditions, go ahead and score yourself out of 12. You know, obviously 12 out of 12 would be a lot of conditions, whereas one out of 12 may not be that severe of a condition. Um, and let's go to the, 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 you know, essentially the answers to that pop quiz. So if you have any of these symptoms, essentially, no matter what your symptom is, or if you're unsure, the answer almost always is to start with the gut. So most people have a digestive disorder and, and until you clear that digestive disorder, it's very unlikely that you are going to see um, much of a, a positive response with a lot of the other conditions that you're treating. So if these pictures are anything like you, if you have digestive pain, if your stomach hurts, if you get chronic headaches, migraines, or you're on the toilet for a long period of time, then definitely um, this presentation is for you and you should get act, you know, get started on some of these things right away. So gut terms. Gut terms can be pretty complicated, um, but these are some of the major ones that you might hear in the world. I know that you, know, you have to Google every single term to get the exact definition, but the truth is each author kind of uses them um, however they want. So, so leaky gut, it, what are we saying when we say leaky gut? To me, leaky gut is some kind of inflammation that is allowing different proteins or larger part particles of food or environmental toxins to pass through that gut lining and into the bloodstream. It's the same thing in, in, in research you're going to find it is called intestinal per permeability. Dysbiosis. So dysbiosis is a little bit different 
than, say, SIBO, which we'll cover in a second. But dysbiosis is, a, is really what most people suffer from. And dysbiosis is a, is a matter of balance. So in our bodies, we have a lot of these organisms that we might consider bad, like E. coli is famous for food poisoning. But traditionally, we all have E. coli in our gut ecosystem, and we, we don't necessarily need to get rid of all of it. Biofilms. Biofilms are also a natural part of the body. It's one of the ways that the immune system hides infection when it's not ready to deal with it. Or if it's too severe of an infection, it will hide that, that biofilm in, in, in like a covering or a layer that covers up the infection until it's ready to deal with it or until it has the resources um, to take care of that. SIBO is just small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Nowadays, we kind of use that um, freely everyone calls it SIBO but the reality is originally SIBO was diagnosed from a large intestine overgrowth problem that resulted in bacteria in the small intestine that came from the large intestine we don't exactly test it that way medically anymore so it's kind of it's kind of a layman's term for some kind of problem with the digestive tract specifically in the small intestine which would be more like a bloating or an urgency or, or some kind of discomfort in in the small intestine candida is probably one of the most common uh, fungal infections that people know about gut flora just refers to everything in the digestive tract, right? So whether they're good, whether they're bad, there's lots of organisms in the digestive tract that are, are you know, both good and bad, and, and they, they truly run our ecosystem. Or in other words, they, they develop chemicals. Um, the most famous one would be something like butyrate, and butyrate is going to calm the gut lining as well as give you brain clarity, uh, but they only come from certain types of bacteria, certain types of, of organisms. Microbes, once again, refers to everything, You'll hear me talk a lot about good bugs and bad bugs because that's just the easy way to talk about it. So good bugs are the ones that should be there in normal quantities or even in high quantities. And bad bugs are the ones that we kind of want to either eliminate or truthfully just lower, lower how severe <clears throat> their level is. Antibiotics. Um, it's really important that we go over that term because antibiotics are specific to bacteria. Whereas antimicrobials can be nonspecific or in, order, in other words, they can be specific to a virus or a parasite, or they can do a little bit of antibacterial work, a little bit of antiviral work. Are there more terms? Yes, there's always more terms. Um, but truthfully, I want to focus on the clinical approach to treating these things rather than giving you an essay on how to become a PhD on gut health terms, um, which doesn't provide much relief for people that are looking to just feel better. So just going over this leaky gut story here, you can see at the top of the picture, you have those little spirals that look like they're going through and into what they call the circulating immune complex, or in other words, the blood. And this is once it's in the bloodstream, once you have something, and it can be infection, and it can be food, and it can be an environmental toxin, once it goes into the blood, then you can have any number of conditions. So you can have brain fog, you can have general inflammation, which is like that joint health or just not feeling well. You can have autoimmunity conditions. So it stimulates the immune system, you develop that problem. You can develop malabsorption and nutrient deficiency. So a lot of, the, a lot of for example, a lot of the nutrients are supposed to be absorbed on those top level cells, which are the mucosal cells. And those should break those down and they should develop into those cells. But if they just pass through that gut lining, then they never adequately get broken down. The two most famous ones that are slow to digest and need a really good um, mucosal lining or a gut barrier are going to be um, zinc and iron. So you'll find a lot of anemia in, in the population due to a leaky gut story. Um, so what is leaky gut syndrome and how does it really work? Uh, looks like we still have a click to add title on the right there. Um, essentially, you can see the cycle, and it's kind of a kind of a scary cycle actually, but but it, it it's consistent and it doesn't stop. So intestinal inflammation of the gut lining at the top. If we go to the left, then we start to have nutrient malabsorption. We start running out of magnesium, iron, zinc, B12, B6, folic acid, all of those. Now all of a sudden we're having a res immune response, which can't be supported properly because we're out of the the vitamins. And then it comes and turns into like a GI issue, multiple food intolerances. Okay, so that's like probably the most common situation in my office. I can't eat anything or I can eat less and less every month. Um, that's multiple food sensitivities. And people are getting sicker and sicker as this cycle continues to turn. Autoimmune disease is huge. And it's, it's hugely common. So if you look at anyone these days, we can, we can run thyroid antibodies on, on most individuals. And you're going to find elevated antibodies frequently, maybe... I don't know, maybe 50% of the time you're going to find antibodies that are elevated. And those elevated antibodies, the problem is all it is is an immune response, but it means that your immune response is a little bit elevated and possibly what we could call out of control. 
Um, so what diseases are specifically associated of the, with the gut? You know, eczema, so all skin disorders are going to be drawn back to the gut. Asthma, obesity, Hashimoto's, which is the thyroid condition, hypothyroidism, chronic fatigue, rheumatoid arthritis goes back to the gut, fibromyalgia, always a gut problem, psoriasis, a huge gut problem, and autism, of course, is on there, um, which, you know, doesn't have a singular cause, but is associated, or in other words, you need a lot of gut health to optimize those conditions. Um, so what's the number one cause of leaky gut? To be honest, that's a good question. Um, at this time, what I would say is one of the main things that causes the leaky gut or causes disruption. So I call it constant disruption. What causes constant disruption in the gut microbiome or where everything would be happy and healthy is glyphosate, so Roundup. And, and Roundup is used more um, than pretty much every any other chemical in, in, in the U.S. right now. It's, it's unbelievable how often it's used. Um, and, and I would say that glyphosate's time frame of introduction as well as how much we use correlates very well with our chronic disease kind of story. Um, so while I don't think that necessarily glyphosate is any more toxic than heavy metals or any more toxic than, um, you know, than candida, for example, we are getting constant exposure to glyphosate. A lot of the air samples um, that, that have been drawn by scientists, you know, up to 75% of America, you're breathing in glyphosate every day. So these are the things that really throw off um, our health or have that chronic constant exposure, which makes it hard to stay healthy all the time without taking action steps. As we talk about in my office all the time, there was a time when people just were mostly healthy and only when you got sick, then you felt really weird and you had to get over your illness. But in the meantime, um, you know, most of the time you were healthy. Uh, nowadays, those days are starting to kind of wean and wane. They're going away. There's not that many people that are just all the time healthy and all the time feel great. Um, and they may not be telling you that, but the reality is most people truly are not feeling amazing 24-7. Um, so let's keep going here. Uh, glyphosate, 85% of tampons, cotton, and sanitary products tested in a new Argentinian study contain glyphosate, right? It's on, it's on everything. So in other words, we're spraying it on certain things. Um, you know, it was sprayed on the cotton, right? So then that cotton goes into our clothing, and now you have glyphosate in your clothing and your sanitary products and things like that. So there's constant exposure. We want to go over why glyphosate is a problem. Uh, it, it affects the shikimate pathway. Um, I have no idea if I'm saying that right. Everyone says it different. Um, and, and if you read on the left, aromatic amino acids are precursors to neurotransmitters, serotonin, melatonin, dopamine, as well as thyroid hormone, and skin tanning agent melanin. Um, so I don't know why I left melanin in there, but what I can tell you is if you look at the neurotransmitter, those are like our feel-good hormones, serotonin and dopamine. And then you have melatonin there, which is a huge factor because a ton of people can't sleep anymore. And sleep is one of the most difficult things to resolve in, a certain, in certain patients. Um, you know, thyroids obviously we know have problems. So let's go over some of these things. Like why does dopamine matter? Okay, so let's look at phenylalanine and tyrosine. Let's go back to the last slide. So if you look on the right, phenylalanine and tyrosine are blocked you know, and tryptophan are blocked when glyphosate's in the system. And we go back here, we look at quantity of dopamine. So if you don't have enough dopamine, these are the things that you might have. Um, pre so phenylalanine and tyrosine, once again, are not dopamine, but eventually, with the help of specific vitamins, convert into dopamine. Okay, so if you experienced poor motivation, hopelessness, frequent loss of temper, inability to handle stress, poor libido, lack of interest, addiction issues, and learning disorders, that could all be a dopamine issue. Now, the, the goal is not just go take a dopamine supplement then. The, the goal is to figure out what is stopping your precursors from turning into dopamine. Um, specifically for women, dopamine does stimulate progesterone release um, and testosterone in men. So if we're blocking this pathway, now we can kind of understand a little bit more clearly why everyone you know, is getting hormone replacement therapy or why men all need testosterone replacement therapy at 25, 35 years old, which traditionally was considered very young. So the question I ask is, do you know anyone with hormone problems? It could be a glyphosate issue. Um, serotonin. So serotonin comes from tryptophan. 
and we need a P in that tryptophan word there, but the, the loss of interest in activity. So let, maybe you, you aren't really depressed, but you just don't enjoy what you do anymore. So you go to the gym and it's like, I used to love the gym, but I don't love it anymore. You go hang out with your friends. I used to love hanging out with my friends, but I don't love it anymore. Um, so that kind of is the presentation, presentation of low serotonin. Um, a lot of people will have lack of joy or down in the dumps type of depression. In other words, it's not suicidal or horrible depression, but it is an issue of just lack of enjoyment, which over time, um, I would say, kind of presents as maybe even a more severe depression, also associated with poor sleep or, la la or insomnia. So um, those are things to pay attention. Other causes of leaky gut. So if you look at these, um, we can kind of look at some, some of the interesting factors here. Um, so gluten can cause a leaky gut. Potatoes, specifically the solanine chemical, can cause a leaky gut. Any other food allergy, any infection, any medication that we take. Medications destroy the gut regularly, NSAIDs being the most predominantly um, accepted ones that just completely damage the gut. A lot of the other ones will too. Aggressive exercise. So if you thought that you could go and do, you know, you know, three CrossFit workouts a day and still have an awesome gut, that is not going to happen for most people. Um, some people can tolerate that, some people cannot. Pesticides, which is kind of, is a chronic exposure, whether you spray them in your yard or inside your house or whether it's your neighbor that's doing it, once again, we're probably breathing those in the air on a regular basic basis. Plastics, big problem. Um, so we want to kind of avoid as many plastics as we can. There's a lot of great books on plastics, but if you read them, you get really scared. So sometimes I just don't recommend reading them. But I would say an awareness that plastics um, and even like containing your water in plastic um, is, is a problem. So a lot, a lot of uh, fish research on this, right? So fish, male fish get exposed to plastics and they start not knowing what gender they are. Um, you know, so you'll see a, a gender changes or, you know, atrophic presentation where essentially they're not presenting as male. The alpha male or the fish that wanted to mate with the other fish no longer does that anymore. Um, so loss of interest with exposure to plastics and nothing else. Um, top causes a leaky gut. So an inflammatory diet. You know, in my office, I don't see a lot of this because most people have already kind of started on the diet pathway. But yeah, a highly inflammatory diet consisting of McDonald's and fried foods and, and just junk that we eat on candy bars and things like that as, as Americans is obviously going to cause a huge problem with leaky gut. Um, inside there, there's a lot of non-foods in there, a lot of chemicals, a lot of pesticides, a lot of glyphosate, all that stuff's in there. Allergies, histamine intolerance, adrenal arrest. Um, so I term that adrenal arrest, which is essentially your adrenals are overworked and they want to break. Um, once your body can no longer calm down the histamine with cortisol because you have other issues going on, then that inflammation in the gut can persist and you, you have problems. Carbohydrates um, can be inflammatory and definitely feed the wrong bacteria and fungus like candida. So on a candida diet, you would be low carbohydrate. GMOs and pesticides, which we already talked about. Caffeine. So caffeine stops digestion and puts you into a stressful mood. I know a lot of people and a lot of the, I don't want to call them health gurus because there's not that many health gurus that actually recommend caffeine. Um, beginning health gurus do. Beginning health gurus will talk about caffeine being good. As soon as you get to patients that are a little bit more sick, um, a little bit stressed out, um, caffeine is never a good thing. Alcohol is not a food. It has nothing nutritious for us. It kills liver cells. Um, that's a very cut and dry point. You know, a lot of my patients do drink some liquor, some wine at night, something like that. But I try to be clear that if you're trying to heal your gut, it is best to be alcohol free. Now that's not the number one cause of leaky gut, but that is a contributor. Same goes with caffeine. You're not going to necessarily have gallbladder failure and a complete leaky gut from drinking a little bit of caffeine. That being said, it does not optimize your digestive health. Okay, gluten, um, you know, Interesting how you know a lot of people can go to Europe and eat gluten there, and the, 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 the genetically modified or preserved or fungicide sprayed bread that we have here doesn't seem to be edible by a lot of people. Um, so something to pay attention to. Um, artificial sweetener, Splenda, essentially kill bacteria and induce obesity, right? So it still has a blood sugar response, and it doesn't support the proper bacteria in your gut or the proper mic microbiome, leading to a case of dysbiosis. 
um, which goes on a leaky gut. Hormones, the only reason I mention this is because a lot of females have digestive issues. Um, you know, birth control pills, IUDs. IUDs are the worst form of birth control. Um, steroid shots, estrogen dominance in men and women, progesterone creams that everyone is on, they all create a burden on the liver and eventually lead to leaky gut. Uh, medications such as antacids decrease digestion, create nutrient deficiencies, stop killing pathogens that we eat or are exposed to in the external environment, um, as well as, as right there it says other drugs tax the liver so detoxification can't happen leading to excess free radicals and both lead to a leaky gut. Um, stress. So a common phenomenon that people need to know is if you have a concussion or a head trauma or an auto accident, you need to start addressing your gut right away. Um, one of the correlations that we can make is, you know, there used to be a lot of just as many head injuries. I mean, maybe there's more head injuries now by a slight percentage, but there used to be a lot of head trauma um, and we didn't have a lot of concussive symptoms. Nowadays, when the blood brain barrier is slightly permeable or leaky gut, leaky brain, then all of a sudden, now when our brain gets hit or when our head hits a wall or whatever it runs into in football and soccer, now all of a sudden we're dealing with um, more permeability. So that trauma creates even more inflammation and that then creates a brain problem or post-concussive syndrome. But the number one cause of leaky gut by far in my office, and I would say still throughout the world, is stealth infections. And I like to call them stealth infection because these stealth infections essentially are infections that you don't experience like a cold, like a cough, like a fever. So if we go to those infections, bacteria, parasites, viruses, and fungi. Parasites, so almost all our vegetables have parasites on them. So people always ask, where do I get those from? Bacteria can be from anything. Nothing is clean. Door handles pass bacteria all the time. Uh, viruses and retroviruses. So viruses are notorious for evolving and they require host mechanisms. And if we look at, there's still a debate in the science world of where, whether viruses are alive or dead, but long story short, they are in us. And, and there's something that, that, what makes them difficult to treat and difficult to find a medicinal compound for is that they thrive on our own type of biology. So they, they can be, those can be some of the more difficult things to treat as, as they, they like to linger. Now viruses are definitely part of the chronic story more than the story of, of acute stomach pain. Um, which kind of brings me to the last, last story. Fungi, a lot of people know that as a candida infection or a yeast infection of the small intestine. So if you have bloating at all, if you ever bloat, I have clinically done this a thousand times, I would suggest that you have some kind of fungal overgrowth that's, that's not getting resolved. I don't care if you've done a fungal treatment before. It's still probably a fungal infection. Going back to viruses though, viruses often create the the food intolerance issue so you're losing a food every week you're like oh i used to be able to eat potatoes now i eat potatoes and i feel sick i used to be able to eat cabbage now i eat cabbage now i feel sick i used to eat brussels sprouts that was fine now i'm sick that story is usually related to a virus if you find that you have to avoid dairy and gluten and corn and soy and all other foods to feel well you likely have a virus in there that's creating a little bit of inflammation that once it's resolved, you'll start to be able to eat some of those foods again, if not all of those foods. Supportive protocols. So this is where a lot of um, things are going wrong as far as medicinal treatments for these things. Um, supportive protocols are not um, adequate enough to treat stealth infection. So I'll go through these because they're the most common that I see. Um, but really, we'll go over at the end what I really recommend that you do. So probiotics, certain, generally beneficial, often yeast-based. So you have a candida problem, that's not a great job, not, not a great idea to use, not quite strong enough for infection. And SIBO is quantity-based. So remember, small intestine bacterial overgrowth means there's too many bacteria in the small intestine, and probiotics add to that number. That being said, most research suge suggests that as long as you're taking a probiotic, it can help. That being said, I don't really think that we should add it to everything we do. So, for example, if you take an antimicrobial and add a probiotic, sometimes it helps. Um, when it comes to sensitive digestive tracts, which is what I usually see in my office, one of the big problems is that people can't tolerate probiotics 
or in other words, adding something like a probiotic is really going to create worse symptoms for them. So in all my patients, I never use them. I cut them out because my patients are usually a little bit sensitive. If you only have stomach pain once a month, okay, fine. Then you can use your probiotic and you can keep going. Digestive enzymes. They should be used temporarily um, because when your enterocytes are relaxed and they're healthy and they're uninflamed, they should be releasing the digestive enzymes that you need. When your pancreas is healthy, when your liver is healthy, when your gallbladder is healthy, all those should be secreting chemicals that digest your food for you rather than having to take in a digestive enzyme to cover up your, your inflammation in the, in the digestive tract. Now, let's say that you know 100% that you have inflammation in your digestive tract and you don't know what to do about it or you've been trying lots of things and you can't find any solutions, then maybe using a digestive enzyme for a temporary period of time might be beneficial in order to help you feel better. Realizing that you need to stop your digestive enzymes and once your digestion is healthier, you're not gonna need them at all. Glutamine, glutamine uh, can convert to glutamate and become an excitotoxin, or in other words, it can kill brain cells. Um, because it needs a lot of P5P or B6, um, which is a common deficiency in almost all patients, um, it can be dangerous to use. So um, I don't use it a ton. I usually recommend after you've been on an antimicrobial protocol for a long time, then we can add glutamine in if you happen to have a bottle, if you like it. It's also expensive. So it's one of those where your bang for your buck is not that good of a return. So I don't use a ton of it in my office. Uh, supportive protocols continued. Uh, fiber. It's okay for overall health. I don't think fiber is a bad thing. And, and some of my supplements like artichoke extract would, would, have, would have some fiber in them. Um, but a lot of times when your gut's really sensitive and inflamed, it makes your story a little bit worse. So in general, we don't use fiber and we avoid adding fiber supplements just because a bowel that's inflamed does not really like to be full of fiber as it absorbs that water. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory, but non-specific, right? So not specific for your gut. Um, we don't use specific omega-3s like fish oils in my office, other than if we're doing a brain fog protocol, which I'm going to add into there. We do a combination of BCSO plus uh, high-dose DHA. Um, and you can find those brands on my website or shoot me an email and I'll let you know which ones those are. Uh, vitamin D. Um, it's dependent upon the liver and kidney function, which can't happen when dysbiosis exists. We don't necessarily want high vitamin D. So if we elevate our vitamin D to an extreme level, it kind of calms down the immune system. So the benefit of that is that you may feel a little bit less inflammation. The downside of that is that you might not kill the pathogens. So it's going to be really hit and miss which cases, or it's, we're going to, have to carefully prescribe vitamin D rather than knowing that we have a low vitamin D level. And so we just start adding vitamin D. More supportive protocols. So kind of the most popular one these days is bone broth or collagen, um, which is good to support, has a cooling effect on the GI tract, but does not address the root cause. Uh, DGL um, can calm an upset stomach or GERD. So sometimes I'll, I'll have patients use that if they, they really have some severe GRD, GERD, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, um, slippery elm is kind of like an antihistaminic type herb. Um, that protects your mucus layer from environmental exposures. Now, if you've done some other protocols and you want to add slippery elm at the end, that can really help, but uh, I really don't see a need for slippery elm too often. Activated charcoal can, I'm sorry, can absorb environmental toxins and metals while infection is being killed. So oftentimes um, we can use activated charcoal depending on the patient. And depending on what that patient is going through, uh, we'll kind of assess whether we need to do charcoal as an acute thing. So in other words, let's say that you had uh, a heavy level of fungal infection in your gut and they were releasing a lot of mycotoxins or fungal, fungal toxins into your gut. Then we might use activated charcoal to absorb some of those toxins while we go ahead and use a diet and, and another protocol to kill the infection. Um, and, and I have this in another slide, but metals can definitely take a long time to to um, get out of the system. So common natura, nat natural antimicrobials people are using, grapefruit seed extract, okay, very common, oil of oregano, best for ears, eyes, nose, and throat. So uh, we use that for sinuses. If you have that kind of chronic sinus congestion that occurs, we will use different blends of oregano oil inside a neti pot or in a nasal spray, and that can be really beneficial. Golden seal contains berberine, which is a huge product but it's not my favorite golden or it's not my favorite berberine product 
in the world. We'll cover that later. Caprylic acid, I think, got a little bit overhyped coming from coconut oil. Um, you can use it. It's completely safe. It usually just affects fungal microbiome rather than others, but it doesn't seem to really be strong enough to make people feel better. You can't, you can't eat a spoonful of coconut oil and think that that's going to heal your gut. That's completely wrong, you know, even, though, even though you've read you know, 400 articles on the benefits of coconut oil. Garlic and allicin I rarely use. Um, definitely great antioxidants, great, great immune support, but not for the gut. Uh, colloidal silver. So I've seen a couple different protocols out there by doctors that are using colloidal silver. In general, I don't think that it makes it to the, the small intestine, if it even makes it to the end of the stomach. Um, so what I recommend is that people use that topically. So if you have a scrape or a cut on your arm, or you want to use it for a sore throat or something like that to where you can actually get the silver on top of the product, um, then I do like colloidal silver for that. Kind of one of my favorite at-home remedies for infections or scrapes. Um, pink eye, things like that that you can actually access. Uh, my favorite antimicrobial supplements. So, Mirinda Citrifolia, aka Noni, has been used forever. It was a big MLM thing uh, in the 90s and 80s, and, and we sold, there, there was a lot that got sold out there. Um, it was watered down, it, it was essentially cooked, and then lots of sugar was added to it, so it didn't have the same benefits, but even then, people knew that, that Noni juice um, had a lot of benefit. Um, I would say that Mirinda is my number two favorite antifungal, so a lot of people are on that. Neem leaf or Malia Azadirachta um, works on certain spirochetes, which, which is what helps it be an effective product, um, and it stimulates the immune system. I'm not finding that I use neem as much as I used to, um, but at the same note, it's very specific for certain viral infections, and I really appreciate that because viruses can be hard to get, get rid of. Um, but once again, another traditional herb that's been used forever. Um, Chinese Coptis by far is my number one selling product in my office and the one that people continue to ask for over and over. And there's a reason and the reason why is because it's a bitter herb and that bitter herb actually stimulates the gallbladder and liver complex all while going ahead and killing that fungal infection. So this is my favorite bird brain product if you look there. And it's been used in Chinese medicine for thousands of years. A lot of the bitters have been used for digestive health for thousands of years. Chinese Coptin, ha Coptis happens to be my favorite. Um, Oregon grape root, grown seal, both have uh, berberine in them. I just like Coptis for its clinical results the most. Uh, Cystis and Canis capsules. Uh, Cystis and Canis is kind of a new one to the market. Um, a lot of people, it's been around forever, but, but we're using it more and more. And, and clinically, I've been noticing that as I use it more and more, people are having more and more die-off reactions or Herx reactions. So I call it a powerful biofilm degrader. Um, it, it tests for antivirals, it tests for as an antifungal, it tests as an antiretroviral. Um, but what I would say, the big thing there is when we're taking cystis and canis to break down kind of chronic low-grade things um, and to release these viruses and funguses back into the system to be defecated or removed, um, the, it's best if we're taking it with another antimicrobial. So it could really be, you know, it could be neem or it could be mirinda or it could be Chinese coptis, that's fine. Um, but I do it with the cystis and canis and we start with one cystis and canis a day and then we work our way all the way up to six um, if it's clinically warranted there. Other supplements, astragalus. It can be used for acute infection, colds, flu, etc. Um, AMG used to make an astragalus, it no longer makes one. Uh, magnesium, obviously a lot of people are using that to make sure that they don't have constipation and their stools are loose, but ideally we shouldn't have to take magnesium every night in order to have a bowel movement. Constipation is most frequently a food allergy. Um, activated bamboo charcoal, it's good for calming an upset stomach. A lot of people like to take it if they know they're going to go to a restaurant and have an exposure, um, or if they're going to have some gluten and they're, they know that they're sensitive to gluten. Um, it's also used for metals, but sometimes you know, metals are very slow to come out of the system. They need to be pulsed. They need to be used constantly. So you would do something like a, like a activated bamboo charcoal in high doses for like two weeks on, two weeks off, and that would help to clear the metals over time. Natokinase, serapeptase, and bulok are essentially um, enzymes that break down biofilms. Um, you know, especially clinically, you would find it really helps with female fibroids to break down any scar tissue. And it, but, it, but it also breaks down the exterior capsule of, of certain fungal organisms. Um, just like 
any other biofilm degrader, you should really be taking an antimicrobial with them to make sure you're killing as much as you can when it comes out. AF Beta Food is a great product from Standard Process. We use it a lot, but it's not really um, this, it's not really a, an infection-related supplement. Really, all we're looking there is to clear out some of the toxins from the liver and the gallbladder in order for your so so that they can deal with more toxins as we kill off the infection, which definitely will happen. All right, so let's get to some of the kind of, kind of more uh, edgy stuff here. There are two major mechanisms at play when the system's infected with the infection, like uh, Lyme disease, Bartonella babesia, um, toxic mold exposures, Epstein-Barr, cytomegalo, mycoplasma, retroviruses. We can add valley fever. We can add Rocky Mountain spotty fever, uh, spotted fever. There's a lot of things that we can add as far as chronic illnesses go. And essentially what I'm saying is that we can track these illnesses and they're never going to go away. Um, and, and, and that's not... Not, you know, in some people you can get lucky and hit a home run. In general, most people are not going to completely eliminate these pathogens from their diet or from, from, their, from their body. Um, so we take a slightly different approach in the patient that say has been through everything um, super sensitive and they, they've, you know, essentially tried all that they could. Um, and that slightly different protocol um, is first, we do still use the same herbs that I mentioned. Like I said, those top four are by far my four uh, most favorite products that I have in my office for addressing the common GI dysfunction story um, and leaky gut story. Um, and, but, but in this next paragraph where it says immune dysfunction, I want to kind of go over what happens. So you have this exposure to something like an Epstein-Barr or a Lyme disease. And what happens is the immune system develops this chronic sensitivity. And that chronic sensitivity ends up in increased inflammation or that the immune system is overstimulated and, it, and because your infection never goes away 100%, because some of these viruses and other organisms are very hard to eradicate, there's always a little bit. Of it. And when your immune system, because it does its job really good, sees a little bit of it, it stays on all the time. And so one of the things that we've been doing is adding homeopathics um, to provide low-dose immunotherapy. And that low-dose immunotherapy um, essentially allows your body not to kill the organism, but to deal with the organism um, and not have an exacerbated reaction. Um, so one of, the, one of the supplements we'll also use, so all Hashimoto's cases that are associated with leaky gut. So anytime I see an elevated antibody, anytime I see an elevated ANA, anytime I see an elevated CRP, high sensitive CRP, I'm gonna add pycnogenol to that story. And pycnogenol essentially is going to calm down that immune system. Now, if I don't have other markers like that, I'm not going to add pycnogenol just for fun because just like vitamin D, it will calm things down. But we don't want to calm things down too much if we're fighting an active infection. So there's definitely protocols and orders that we do these things in so that you can, you can stay healthy and not, not make things worse than you're already in. Um, so I do use colostrum sometimes to support innate pre-infection immune system. Or in other words, this is what you got from, from your mother's milk. And that, that colostrum can support immune factors that aren't necessarily stimulated with chronic infections. So it, it's supporting a separate arm um, of the immune system that doesn't usually get elevated or stimulated when you have a chronic condition. Um, so that, once again, another case-by-case -case story, but, I, but colostrum is definitely a great way to rebuild your immune system if you're just low in your immune system. And it rebuilds the specific arm of the immune system that doesn't create chronic inflammation and disorders like that. Um, my products as far as homeopathics, I'm using Desbio products, uh, and they have specific home accords. Uh, so that, in other words, these, these products, these home accords are made um, for you know, so for for example, Epstein Barr, or you can get a, a Lyme disease one. You can get a co-infection one that's for all the co-infections of Lyme disease. Um, and and so if you have been muscle tested, like we use in my office a lot of, or lab tested for these infections, you can add them to your protocol um, for three to six months in order to um, essentially calm down your immune response to it. So a lot of people have had lab tests and found elevated titers. Um, which doesn't necessarily indicate an infection. So what it indicates is you're that you're having an immune response to something. In most cases, so just like the chicken pox, you can be having a constant immune response 
um, to an innocuous infection. So you contracted the chickenpox, say, when you were 10, and it never goes away your whole life. You carry it with you the rest of your life, with, which can be a really good thing. And, but you could still have titers that indicate that you're, that, that are elevated, that indicate that your immune system is still creating inflammation based upon that old infection, which isn't really a problem. All right, so here's what we do. So, so obviously, we kind of talked about my protocols right there, some of the things that you can do to start, which are completely different than what you might have read online. So that's why I love doing this presentation. Um, remove irritants. So you want to remove foods that are creating inflammation. Start with a paleo-type diet and find a diet that works for you that's gluten-free, dairy-free. So stay gluten-free, dairy-free. Find something that you can successfully do day in and day out so that you're not cheating six days a week and doing it one day a week. Find something that, that works with your lifestyle. Um, uh, Antifungal diets, we essentially we combine that with a paleo. So we're doing low-carb paleo um, in order to just make sure that we're not feeding infection bacterial or fungal or any other kind. Uh, remove GMOs and pesticides or at least rinse before eating. Um, the big thing there is we're trying to avoid as much environmental toxins as possible so that we don't disrupt that, that ecosystem inside. So the ecosystem is happy until we disrupt it with toxic foods and things like that. Uh, especially for females, avoid toxic makeups and for anyone else, avoid cleaning chemicals that can be super toxic if you were to clean once a month and you were already healthy once again that, that that cleaning chemical may not set you off but if you're a chronically sensitive person any cleaning chemical can be too much for the system it could be ammonia it could be just the smell the aldehydes it could be anything that sets you off from a cleaning chem chemical so we say stay clear of those uh, remove infection so remove infection kill the bugs feel better this is the main point that i want you guys to understand we're using antimicrobials, antimicrobials, and more antimicrobials. I highly recommend they use the ones that I mentioned, not just random ones you've read about. Okay, so, so anyone can write an article online. I would say that all my herbs that I'm using right now have been clinically tested or I've used them with real patients and I keep using them because I see results. Every year, there's certain, certain herbs that kind of phase out of the system. They haven't tested for people a while. People aren't responding to them as much, and we kind of cut those out. Um, I test hundreds of new herbs every year. Only a rare few get added to my protocols, right? So let's say that we just, uh, one of the fun things that I do is, is I like to go and find a new herb from a new country or a new um, ancient Chinese remedy, and, and what I'll do is I'll get those individual herbs and we'll test them out. I'll take them myself, I'll give them to friends and family, I'll give them to some patients, and we'll muscle test them all on patients to see what the response is. Um, if there's a positive response from our trial, then we'll start you know, using it more in protocols and we see what happens. Out of hundreds that I get every year, only a few of them actually end up in staying in my office. So for example, you could say like cystus this year is one that I added and stays. Astragalus is one that I used to carry a lot of um, and it just doesn't seem to work as well anymore. We use more andrographis, which is really the opposite of what most people are saying online. So andrographis supports a certain specific side of the immune system um, that I find clinically works really well. but but as far as the research goes, it shouldn't help that well, but it certainly does. All right, so what are you gonna do? Uh, continued, restore digestive organs. So once you've kind of killed infection and you've dealt with the gut specifically, you're gonna go and move to the immune system. So we've talked about that. So that's like pycnogenol, it's lowering your antibody. It's that chronic homeopathic remedies to where you're lowering your immune system's response to innocuous things. Um, you're going to address the adrenals so that the adrenals can produce the cortisol to calm the inflammation in case you do have an attack or an exposure to something. You're going to look at the thyroid, make sure that the cells are all replicating and living and dying the right amount of time, which the thyroid regulates. Um, you're going to look at gallbladder and liver stress um, and looking at cleanses there. But first, we're going to do the gut, and we're going to do that by using antimicrobials or herbs to kill infection. Um, eventually, yes, stress and hormone imbalances are pretty critical. For most females, I would say that hormone imbalances is, is, is a huge factor as far as how well you feel. It's not a as, as often a specific leaky gut factor. Um, while your hormones can create a leaky gut situation, what I would say is it's really the overburden of the liver and the gallbladder that creates a free radical condition that then leads to a leaky gut. So the direct problem is not as as prominent in the patient population. Uh, and, and then the last thing we're going to do is, is repair the gut lining. This is where we're going to add glutamine. This is where we'll add slippery elm, bone broth, collagen, healthy foods, sauerkraut, maybe the occasional probiotic, a pill a week or something like that. 
um, just to give some variety in there. We're doing things that prevent the gut from getting injured again. We're managing our stress. We're taking vacations. We're getting outside and breathing fresh air instead of our, our city air inside, you know, these, these small cubicle offices where we're getting out into nature. We're sniffing. We're breathing. We're interacting with dirt. We're getting to the beach. Those are the things that we're doing to support our gut lining to keep it from getting injured in the, in the future. Or in other words, we're trying to make this now part of our lifestyle. Um, and that's it. So essentially, now you know the protocol that I'm using to this very day. This is uh, um, 2019. So we're using this protocol with almost all patients and we're seeing great results. So um, if you have any questions, you, know, you can always go to my website. So drhoustonanderson.com. And on that website, you're going to have a ton of information. Um, and, and really, if you read enough articles, you start to, start to get the gist of what are some of the major factors that are affecting almost every condition that's chronic on earth? So everything that's not acute, everything that's not an ankle sprain, anything that's chronic, the, the fatigues, the, the fibromyalgia, the, the Lyme disease, all that really has these root causes that we have to address. With regards to leaky gut, definitely have articles there and definitely elaborate on how a leaky gut can be causing a lot of your symptoms. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. My email is docdoc at drhoustonanderson.com. Um, and obviously, I have two offices in Arizona that I work from. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. Email is the fastest way to get a hold of me. Um, but but my, my story to you is that by addressing the leaky gut story that you have, no matter whether you've, you believe it or not, Almost every chronic condition is associated with a leaky gut. And I hope to see you guys online. Thanks a lot.